Lesson 4 Prayer Power Interceding for Others Sabbath Afternoon July 18 We need to feel the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit as the disciples felt it on the day of Pentecost. Of their experience at that time we read, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. Selfishness was expelled from the heart, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Reflecting Christ, page 241. By the grace of Christ, the apostles were made what they were. It was sincere devotion and humble, earnest prayer that brought them into close communion with Him. They sat together with Him in heavenly places. They realized the greatness of their debt to Him. By earnest, persevering prayer, they obtained the endowment of the Holy Spirit, and then they went forth, weighted with the burden of saving souls, filled with zeal to extend the triumphs of the cross. And under their labors, many souls were brought from darkness to light, and many churches were raised up. Shall we be less earnest than were the apostles? Shall we not by living faith claim the promises that moved them to the depths of their being to call upon the Lord Jesus for the fulfillment of his word? Ask and ye shall receive. John chapter 16 verse 24. Is not the Spirit of God to come today in answer to earnest, persevering prayer and fill men with power? Is not God saying today to His praying, trusting, believing workers who are opening the Scriptures to those ignorant of the precious truth they contain, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world? Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Why then is the church so weak and spiritless? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 32. The God whom we serve is no respecter of persons. He who gave to Solomon the spirit of wise discernment is willing to impart the same blessing to his children today. If any of you lack wisdom, his word declares, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James chapter 1 verse 5. When a burden bearer desires wisdom more than he desires wealth, power, or fame, he will not be disappointed. Such a one will learn from the great teacher not only what to do, but how to do it in a way that will meet the divine approval. So long as he remains consecrated, the man whom God has endowed with discernment and ability will not manifest an eagerness for high position, neither will he seek to rule or control. Of necessity, men must bear responsibilities, but instead of striving for the supremacy, he who is a true leader will pray for an understanding heart to discern between good and evil. Prophets and Kings, page 31 Sunday, July 19 A Cosmic Struggle Christ did not tell his disciples that their work would be easy. He showed them the vast confederacy of evil arrayed against them. They would have to fight against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. But they would not be left to fight alone. He assured them that he would be with them, and that if they would go forth in faith, they should move under the shield of omnipotence. He bade them be brave and strong, for one mightier than angels would be in their ranks the general of the armies of heaven. He made full provision for the prosecution of their work and took upon himself the responsibility of its success. So long as they obeyed his word and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. Go to all nations, he bade them. Go to the farthest part of the habitable globe and be assured that my presence will be with you even there. Labor in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will forsake you. I will be with you always, helping you to perform your duty, guiding, 
comforting, sanctifying, sustaining you, giving you success in speaking words that shall draw the attention of others to heaven. The Acts of the Apostles, page 29. We have unseen foes to meet. Evil men are agents for the powers of darkness to work through, and without spiritual discernment, the soul will be ignorant of Satan's devices and be ensnared and stumble and fall. He who would overcome must hold fast to Christ. He must not look back, but keep the eye ever upward. Mount up by the Mediator, keeping hold of the Mediator, reaching upward to one line of work after another, making no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1094. The very first effort of Satan to overthrow God's law, undertaken among the sinless inhabitants of heaven, seemed for a time to be crowned with success. A vast number of the angels were seduced, but Satan's apparent triumph resulted in defeat and loss, separation from God, and banishment from heaven. There are thousands today echoing the same rebellious complaint against God. They do not see that to deprive man of the freedom of choice would be to rob him of his prerogative as an intelligent being and make him a mere automation. It is not God's purpose to coerce the will. Man was created a free moral agent. Like the inhabitants of all other worlds, he must be subjected to the test of obedience, but he is never brought into such a position that yielding to evil becomes a matter of necessity. No temptation or trial is permitted to come to him which he is unable to resist. God made such ample provision that man need never have been defeated in the conflict with Satan. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 331 and 332. Monday, July 20. Jesus, the Mighty Intercessor. No other life was ever so crowded with labor and responsibility as was that of Jesus. Yet how often he was found in prayer! How constant was his communion with God! Again and again in the history of his earthly life are found records such as these. Rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 in a life wholly devoted to the good of others, the Savior found it necessary to withdraw from the thoroughfares of travel and from the throng that followed him day after day. He must turn aside from a life of ceaseless activity and contact with human needs to seek retirement and unbroken communion with his Father. As one with us, a sharer in our needs and weaknesses, he was wholly dependent upon God, and in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth braced for duty and trial. In a world of sin, Jesus endured struggles and torture of soul. In communion with God, he could unburden the sorrows that were crushing him. Here he found comfort and joy. The Desire of Ages, pages 362 and 363. When Jesus said that the harvest was great and the laborers were few, he did not urge upon his disciples the necessity of ceaseless toil, but said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. As activity increases and men become successful in doing any work for God, there is danger of trusting to human plans and methods. There is a tendency to pray less and to have less faith. Like the disciples, we are in danger of losing sight of our dependence on God and seeking to make a Savior of our activity. We need to look constantly to Jesus, realizing that it is His power which does the work. While we are to labor earnestly for the salvation of the lost, we must also take time for meditation, for prayer, and for the study of the Word of God. Only the work accomplished with much prayer and sanctified by the merit of Christ will in the end prove to have been efficient for good. The Desire of Ages, pages 361 and 362. Many stand where Peter stood when in self-confidence he declared that he would not deny his Lord. 
and because of their self-sufficiency, they fall an easy prey to Satan's devices. Those who realize their weakness trust in a power higher than self, and while they look to God, Satan has no power against them. But those who trust in self are easily defeated. Let us remember that if we do not heed the cautions that God gives us, a fall is before us. Christ will not save from wounds the one who places himself unbidden on the enemy's ground. He lets the self-sufficient one, who acts as if he knew more than his Lord, go on in his supposed strength. Then comes suffering and a crippled life, or perhaps defeat and death. Our High Calling, page 307 Tuesday, July 21 Paul's Intercessory Prayers Intercession is the golden chain which binds finite man to the throne of the infinite God. The human agent whom Christ has died to save importunes the throne of God, and his petition is taken up by Jesus, who has purchased him with his own blood. Our great high priest places his righteousness on the side of the sincere suppliant, and the prayer of Christ blends with that of the human petitioner. Christ has urged that his people pray without ceasing. This does not mean that we should always be upon our knees, but that prayer is to be as the breath of the soul. Our silent requests, wherever we may be, are to be ascending unto God, and Jesus, our advocate, pleads in our behalf, bearing up with the incense of his righteousness, our requests to the Father. That I may know him, page 78. The heart that has once tasted of the love of Christ cries out continually for a deeper draft, and as you impart, you will receive in richer and more abundant measure. Every revelation of God to the soul increases the capacity to know and to love, The continual cry of the heart is, More of thee, and ever the Spirit's answer is, Much more. The life of Christ was a life charged with a divine message of the love of God, and he longed intensely to impart this love to others in rich measure. Compassion beamed from his countenance, and his conduct was characterized by grace and humility, love and truth. Every member of his church militant must manifest the same qualities if he would join the church triumphant. The love of Christ is so broad, so full of glory, that in comparison to it, everything that man esteems so great dwindles into insignificance. When we obtain a view of it, we exclaim, Oh, the depth of the riches of the love that God bestowed upon men in the gift of His only begotten Son! Our High Calling, page 366 The grace of God sustained Paul in his imprisonment, enabling him to rejoice in tribulation. With faith and assurance, he wrote to his Philippian brethren that his imprisonment had resulted in the furtherance of the gospel. There is a lesson for us in this experience of Paul's, for it reveals God's way of working. The Lord can bring victory out of that which may seem to us discomfiture and defeat. We are in danger of forgetting God, of looking at the things which are seen, instead of beholding by the eye of faith the things which are unseen. When misfortune or calamity comes, we are ready to charge God with neglect or cruelty. If He sees fit to cut off our usefulness in some line, we mourn, not stopping to think that thus God may be working for our good. We need to learn that chastisement is a part of his great plan and that under the rod of affliction, the Christian may sometimes do more for the master than when engaged in active service. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 480 and 481. Wednesday, July 22. Unseen Powers at Work. Heavenly beings are appointed to answer the prayers of those who are working unselfishly for the interests of the cause of God. The very highest angels in the heavenly courts are appointed to work out the prayers which ascend to God for the advancement of the cause of God. 
Each angel has his particular post of duty, which he is not permitted to leave for any other place. If he should leave, the powers of darkness would gain an advantage. Day by day, the conflict between good and evil is going on. Why is it that those who have had many opportunities and advantages do not realize the intensity of this work? They should be intelligent in regard to this. God is the ruler. By his supreme power, he holds in check and controls earthly potentates. Through his agencies, he does the work which was ordained before the foundation of the world. Lift him up. Page 370. As a people, we do not understand, as we should, the great conflict going on between invisible agencies, the controversy between loyal and disloyal angels. Evil angels are constantly at work, planning their line of attack, controlling as commanders, kings, and rulers, the disloyal human forces. I call upon the ministers of Christ to press home upon the understanding of all who come within the reach of their voice, the truth of the ministration of angels. Do not indulge in fanciful speculations. The written word is our only safety. We must pray, as did Daniel, that we may be guarded by heavenly intelligences. As ministering spirits, angels are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Pray, my brethren, pray as you have never prayed before. We are not prepared for the Lord's coming. We need to make thorough work for eternity. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1173. What great honor is shown to Daniel by the majesty of heaven. He comforts his trembling servant and assures him that his prayer has been heard in heaven. In answer to that fervent petition, the angel Gabriel was sent to affect the heart of the Persian king. The monarch had resisted the impressions of the Spirit of God during the three weeks while Daniel was fasting and praying, but heaven's prince, the archangel, Michael, was sent to turn the heart of the stubborn king to take some decided action to answer the prayer of Daniel. Daniel was a devoted servant of the Most High. His long life was filled up with noble deeds of service for his master. His purity of character and unwavering fidelity are equaled only by his humility of heart and his contrition before God. The life of Daniel is an inspired illustration of true sanctification. The Sanctified Life, pages 51 and 52. Thursday, July 23. Prayer Focus The repetition of set customary phrases when the heart feels no need of God is of the same character as the vain repetitions of the heathen. Prayer is not an expiation for sin. It has no virtue or merit of itself. All the flowery words at our command are not equivalent to one holy desire. The most eloquent prayers are but idle words if they do not express the true sentiments of the heart. But the prayer that comes from an earnest heart, when the simple wants of the soul are expressed, as we would ask an earthly friend for a favor, expecting it to be granted, this is the prayer of faith. God does not desire our ceremonial compliments, but the unspoken cry of the heart, broken and subdued with a sense of its sin and utter weakness, finds its way to the Father of all mercy. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 86 Jesus himself, while he dwelt among men, was often in prayer. Our Savior identified himself with our needs and weaknesses in that he became a suppliant, a petitioner, seeking from his Father fresh supplies of strength that he might come forth braced for duty and trial. He is our example in all things. He is a brother in our infirmities, in all points tempted like as we are, but as the sinless one, his nature recoiled from evil. He endured struggles and torture of soul in a world of sin. His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with his Father. And if the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer? 
Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us the fullness of His blessing. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless love. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of His children, and yet there is much manifest reluctance on our part to make known our wants to God. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who are subject to temptation when God's heart of infinite love yearns toward them, ready to give them more than they can ask or think, and yet they pray so little and have so little faith? The angels love to bow before God. They love to be near Him. They regard communion with God as their highest joy, and yet the children of earth who needs so much the help that God only can give, seems satisfied to walk without the light of His Spirit, the companionship of His presence. Steps to Christ, pages 93 and 94. They that are abiding in Jesus have the assurance that God will hear them because they love to do His will. They offer no formal wordy prayer, but come to God in earnest, humble confidence as a child to a tender father and pour out the story of their grief and fears and sins and in the name of Jesus present their wants. They depart from his presence rejoicing in the assurance of pardoning love and sustaining grace. Our High Calling, page 147. For further reading, in heavenly places, According to God's Will, page 82, and Testimonies for the Church, volume 7, Work for Church Members, pages 19 to 24.